The ongoing war in Ukraine seemed to have started on February the 24th, 2022, though in January 2022, 71% of Ukrainians have already believed that they were at war with Russia. And they are not wrong, because in reality the conflict had started long before the current time. Once united under the same roof of Soviets, Moscow and Kiev were very close, and the major love thy neighbor on the continent was mutual up until recently. But we need to take a closer look at what seemed to be the perfect relationship. How come that not so long ago friendly Russia decided to invade its neighbor? Why and how did Russia finally lose its ally, Ukraine? What events have led to such a perfect relationship crumbling down? What went wrong? Keith Gesson of The Guardian said in his article, Ukraine was unique in all these fronts. Though it had only existed as an independent state in modern times for a few short years, it had a powerful nationalist movement, a vibrant literary canon, and a strong memory of its independent place in the history of Europe before Peter the Great. Even though the history of Ukrainian sentiments takes us back to the time prior to modern reality, the main events that played a crucial role in its relationship with Russia happened in the early 90s. As Ukraine declared itself independent after the fall of the Soviets in 1991, it inherited a massive fertile territory, a robust military industry, valuable mining deposits, and a population of no less than 52 million citizens. In an instant, Ukraine was one of the most promising nations in Europe, at least in theory. Despite the sudden sovereignty from another state, Ukraine neither disappeared from the radar nor became a poor state. It also inherited a large nuclear arsenal and no means of maintaining them. So, as a measure of goodwill, it gave away the bombs in return for security guarantees and respect for its borders, as stipulated in the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, with Russia being one of the signatories. In 1997, an additional agreement was also signed with Moscow, consolidating further mutual partnership. All of that tightened profitable, effective, even fraternal relationship between two countries. This kept on for a while, and considering the difference of Russia and Ukraine in size in all aspects, it actually resulted in making Kiev highly subordinate to thy neighbor, dependent on it economically and pressured politically. And it is not all about the economy and politics only. Let's look at the demographics. One third of Russians, even now, still have relatives and friends living in Ukraine. Both countries are deeply interlinked ethnically, and most of the population speak either Russian or both languages. As a result, the Russian population has been of a significant influence during the elections. Eastern regions have been substantially inhabited by Russians and usually have been voting for pro-Russian candidates and parties. Ukrainian nationalists were infuriated by the influence Russians had in their country, while Russian nationalists found the past joint memories consolidating and inspiring. They both even asked the same question. Why are there two languages in the country if you can speak one? with Ukrainians obviously pushing for their own language and Russians for their own. Rising social tensions couldn't be held back on its own. The disputes slowly but surely drifted into and merged with political life. With the growing Russian influence on Ukrainians' lives in the social aspect, the political one couldn't be ignored as well. Having signed tons of memorandums and partnership agreements with Russia, the dependency of Ukraine on its big brother has reached even the top-tier level of the state's governance system. 
Leonid Kuchma, the second president of Ukraine, took office in the middle 90s, and his political directions were pointed towards creating close ties with Russia, in which, by the way, he was quite successful. His almost 10 years in the presidential office has made him somewhat dependent on Russia and made him have pro-Russia sentiments. Kuchma basically continued to play with Moscow by the old Soviet rules. After his second term, he planned to appoint a contractual successor as president while retaining real power, like Putin and Medvedev did between 2008 and 2012. Given the degree to which Russia controlled its neighbor, potential applicants for the Ukrainian presidency went to Moscow for interviewing quite often. The main contender was Ukrainian pro-Russian prime minister at the time, the former governor of the Donetsk region, Viktor Yanukovych. The following close affiliation with Russia was obvious. Putin regularly travelled to Ukraine, Yanukovych regularly travelled to Russia, they even did so together a lot. All that to push for each other's ideas and show support. Here is an interview Putin gave when campaigning for the future president. I like the Ukrainian language. I know it a little bit. When I was a student, I tried to read Kobza, but there was only one thing I remembered back then because it kind of suited my mood at the time. The day goes by and the night goes by, and with your head in your hands, you wonder why the apostle of truth and science is not on his way. Mr. President, is there a branch with Ukrainian hue on your genealogical tree? No. As Vysotsky sang, if only one has got in with me, he must be a Tatar. But seriously? All my relatives are from Tver province, Russia. It's about 200 kilometers from Moscow. And for many centuries, they not only lived at the same place, but also went to the same church, as it turned out, because all this data was derived from church documents. But if it suddenly appeared that I had such family ties, I would only be proud of it. I like Ukraine. Compare this with his current position. It wasn't a secret that Russian political strategists flooded the country when money started pouring from the Kremlin in support of the pro-Russian presidential campaign. At some point, another main competitor for the presidency, an oppositionist and a supporter of a more Western direction, Viktor Yushchenko, was poisoned. Although not fatally a disfigured candidate coupled with constant Ukrainian TV interviews from Putin, who was at that moment more popular than any other politician in the country, caused wild panic among the opposition. All that led to Yanukovych victory in the second round of election in 2004. However, it was then publicly revealed to be fraudulent, and that gave rise to the so-called Orange Revolution. Hundreds of thousands of people came out in a peaceful protest, demanding re-elections and a fair vote count. The authorities didn't dare to disperse the rally on Putin's orders, though, therefore the third election round took place in the early 2005, and in the actual fair play, the oppositionist, Yushchenko, won. Moscow couldn't leave it unattended, having failed their plan of appointing the right president. Russia started brewing some turmoil and began an aggressive informational attack, blaming the West for the revolution. If not them, then who else could have stabbed us in the back, they said. At this time, they began building an anti-fascist propaganda, which was only a rehearsal for 2014, which in turn was a rehearsal for 2022. As a compromise, Yanukovych was endorsed by Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine as Prime Minister in 2006, but a year later, the political struggle in the administration reached its climax, revealing numerous acts of corruption, so the acting president Yushchenko dissolved the parliament and dismissed the evil Yanukovych. However, the population's disappointment in Yushchenko's politics grew stronger. One of the most important concerns of common people was the integration of Ukraine into the European Union. Yushchenko completely failed to deliver it, showing his own ineffectiveness and incompetency in the matter. Yanukovych, on the other hand, gained strength on the promises to join the EU. 
Therefore, despite hideous corruption and his open pro-Russian sentiments, he was given a chance in the next elections in 2010, when he finally succeeded in becoming the president. In our previous videos about the Power Vertical, a unique governance system here in Russia, we told how the upper echelon of the Russian government appoints the right governors to regions. That makes those regional heads nothing more than puppets. Just so you get a clear idea, in case of Ukraine, they were eager to do the same. To make Yanukovych, or whatever fitting candidate for presidency, some sort of governor that would follow the Putin's lead thus making Ukraine a subordinate region to the Russian Federation. But things did not go as planned. After three years of Yanukovych's presidency since 2010, followed by an even closer affiliation with Russia, the promise on joining the EU was dragged on and on during this period. The turning point took place on November 21, 2013, a week before the Vilnius summit. Yanukovych made a sharp U-turn, announcing that he suspended preparations for signing the EU Association Agreement, which would have opened borders for trade and easier travelling between European countries. Yanukovych could not afford to sacrifice trade with Russia, which opposed the deal with the Union. He also called an EU loan of 610 million euros inadequate, originally requesting 20 billion euro a year to bring Ukraine's economy to European standards. The rejection of EU integration was a turning point that did not please the central and western populations of Ukraine, who felt they'd been betrayed by the president and sold to Moscow. So, protesting movements for European integration and the president's resignation immediately began gathering in Kiev. These protests, which were then supported by the opposition, acquired the well-known name of Euro Maiden because they took place on Maidan Nezaleznosti or Independence Square. Though the rallies were peaceful at the start, this changed on December the 1st when the protesters' camp was being dispersed by the forces. The leadership was then taken over by radical nationalists, armed and trained ones, and some government buildings were soon seized. The protesters' demands became more radical, and the peaceful action was turned into an urban war with barricades and murders. The Ukrainian authorities tried to resolve the situation in different ways. On January the 16th, dictatorship laws on extremists with a bunch of other laws were approved simultaneously. Obviously, it only infuriated people. Yanukovych even attempted offering one of the opposition leaders the post of the Prime Minister and signing agreements that were to carry out constitutional reform and early elections, but people didn't buy it and began threatening to seize even more government buildings. While Yanukovych was trying to figure out how to stop the revolution, Putin again accused the West of helping the opposition and the planned seizure of Ukrainian power. This was based on the fact that the US Assistant Secretary of State Newland and Senator McCain spoke from the podium during the protest. Allegedly, NATO countries initially planned to expand the alliance, and now they want to use it to erase the influence from Russia. Add weapons and personnel that were getting closer to the Russian borders to it. The Kremlin probably wasn't right about the whole Western conspiracy, but they were not wrong in thinking that the West had never seen them as an equal. And it made sense, in a sense. And look, I, I know it's hard to feel sorry for anybody with a Russian accent, but I do actually understand why Russia is so freaked out by NATO. Because here's the thing. Don't forget that NATO was formed to oppose the Soviet Union, right? That's why it was formed. Then the Soviet Union broke up. But instead of disbanding, NATO has been expanding closer and closer to Russia's borders. So from a Russian point of view, just a Russian point of view, it's, it's almost like they lost a boxing match, but then the guy who beat them moved in next door. Uh, the fight is over, what are you doing here? I don't know, man, you tell me. The understanding of this appeared in the Kremlin long before Maiden, but it was the protests that gave the signal for action. 
Despite the proactive informational and political battle of Putin with the West and the battle of Yanukovych with protesters, the latter failed to succeed in finding the resolution for the domestic crisis and the revolution. In the end, Yanukovych was impeached. On February the 24th of 2014, the former president was put on the criminal wanted list and it became clear that the situation wouldn't take a U-turn and unfold to a previous state. But it wasn't the end, though. Many Russian-speaking regions didn't support the change and continued to advocate a deeper integration with Russia. According to Mikhail Zygar's book, All the Kremlin's Men, back in December 2013, the head of the Crimean Supreme Council arrived in Moscow and said that in the event of Yanukovych's overthrow, Crimea would like to become a part of Russia. The annexation of Crimea was inevitable. Almost everyone in the Russian administration was already inspired by the idea, and the rest didn't have enough power to overpersuade Putin, who was always making decisions without the parliament's permission. The president even warned about such an outcome back in 2008 at the Russia NATO summit. The emergence of a powerful military bloc on our borders, whose members' actions are regulated in part by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, will be perceived in Russia as a direct threat to our country's security. It was a foregone conclusion since Crimea was the most essential strategic base of the Black Sea Fleet, which Russia had been leasing from Ukraine since 1991. On February the 26th, 2014, the so-called Little Green Men landed in Crimea, or polite people as propaganda called them, and the territory was captured. After all that, a referendum was held about the legitimacy of which nothing is known. The peninsula, officially, so to speak, became a part of Russia. In addition to the Crimean annexation, after the months-long maiden, other political forces came to power in the country, which dramatically turned the vector of national development and, well, different people in different regions perceived it differently. Due to the evacuation of the pro-Russian Yanukovych, the Russian-speaking population of the South and East felt deprived of civil rights. Mass counter-demonstrations with Russian flags under the slogan of Anti-Maiden began. The Donbass War was brewing. The militia seized administrative buildings and held Donetsk for 40 days. Though the region was surrounded by the Ukrainian security service, which was ready to cut it off from the border with Russia, but with neighborly help, Donetsk went on a counter-offensive. The support wasn't only the cannon fodder. Gas, electricity and cash were supplied directly from Russia in order to support the uprising. The same happened in the Luhansk region as well. Ideas were regularly put forward about the formation of Novorossiya, which is translated as New Russia, consisting of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. But the signed Minsk Agreements of 2014, which sought to end the war in Donbass, were poorly observed and only maintained tension. Only these two territories were a bone of contention for the next eight years up to the current time. The rest of the massively protesting regions weren't supported by Russia, so they gave up in attempts to declare independence. It's, uh, for example, Kharkiv, Mariupol, Zaporozhye, where about two-thirds of the population is Russian-speaking and about a third ethnic Russians. This is where recently the most active military advances of the current war have taken place. Despite poor observation, Minsk agreements between Russia and Ukraine with the leaders of France and Germany as the mediators did result in some peace from both sides. Although succeeding in a ceasefire in some regions, such as ending the Battle of Debaltsevi and an approved Ukrainian law on special status for Donbass, in March 2016 it has been stated that at least 430 Ukrainian soldiers had died since the signing of the agreements. 
By 2019, there was a consensus in all media that reported zero fully implemented provisions of the Minsk deal. One could argue that these years haven't been easy for either side of the conflict. However, as we look at the civilian and the total death tolls, we could notice that the numbers were constantly declining and were nothing in comparison to what 2022 has brought us. The approximate casualties have already been exceeded in just two months, which leaves everyone with the question, was it worth it? Many call what's happening now, eight years later after the Euro Maiden, a kind of personal retribution from Putin to Ukraine for revolution in 2014. Others say that Putin wanted to depose the Ukrainian government, ending its desire to join NATO. Some are even saying that he wanted to reconstitute the Russian Empire and bring back its original borders. Is it now possible to answer why Putin needs this war in Ukraine? Has he achieved his goals? Has Putin won Crimea but lost Ukraine? These questions will be answered by Boris Nemtsov, a politician and a former opposition leader who was persecuted by the FSB all the way until his murder in 2015 after publicly expressing sympathy and assistance in the West's decision to impose sanctions against Russia. I believe that what he is doing is inflicting enormous damage to Russia, to the citizens of my country, and is inflicting enormous damage to Ukraine and the citizens of Ukraine. I get it. If he really wanted to help Russians in Crimea, he could have done so. Right now, for example, he could help teachers, doctors, pensioners, and so on financially. He could have invested money in road repairs, construction, etc. Why take over someone else's territory? We have a huge country yet have no roads in Russia, we have more than 20 million people in poverty, we have frozen salaries and pensions, we have rising prices for everything, we have an economic crisis. Can anyone explain to me why we need more foreign territory? Why do we need it? Who needs it? Why should a friendly, fraternal nation be turned into an enemy? I don't understand. I cannot rationally explain Putin's behavior. Apparently, he is taking revenge on Ukraine for the maiden. Apparently, he is frantically afraid that a maiden could happen in Russia. I want to responsibly tell you that there will be no maiden in Russia unless Putin provokes it. If he steals like Yanukovych, if he runs rampant like Yanukovych, if he shoots people like Yanukovych, of course he will get his maiden, it is true. If he behaves decently, we will not have one. I have a feeling he is annexing Crimea to avoid maiden and not to help anyone out there. Isn't that obvious? 